Hi, it's Dr. Centeno, and uh, thanks so much for joining us today in this new year of 2023. Uh, <clears throat> happy holidays and uh, happy new year. Today, we're going to be talking about an interesting topic, and that's going to be who should consider avoiding the PICL procedure. Uh, I'm going to go over a little bit, very small amount of the data that I'll review this coming Friday. Um, which is the data that I, that I got uh, when I was uh, out in October, and I finally put it together into a presentation. Uh, we were looking at just in general how the PICL procedure was doing, and also whether we could see a difference between HEDS patients and patients who didn't have that diagnosis. So, but what that data brings up is what we've always kind of known, or at least for the last year uh, have known. And that is that while the vast majority of patients do very well with this procedure, we've got about 5% of the patients who should probably avoid it. And now the next step's gonna be figuring out who those are. Now I've got some clues from having taken care of lots and lots of people uh, who have gone through this procedure. And I'm going to go through some of those today. We'll be looking at uh, that data next. So again, I'll show you just a little snippet of the data we're going to see on Friday to give you a sense of the scale of the number or percentage of people who should probably avoid the PICL procedure. Uh, and then we'll do a much bigger uh, dive into that data on Friday. So let me start this here. I'm going to share my uh, screen. Looks like that worked. And I'll get this presentation started here. And it's going to pen. So uh, who should consider avoiding the PICL procedure to treat CCI? So, you know, we've helped a lot of people avoid surgery. And the good news is that the vast majority of those people who got the PICL procedure are over here. But there is a small percentage that probably shouldn't get the procedure. Uh, so... That's what we're going to talk about today. Now, been doing this for a while, and you know, way back when in 2015, when I first uh, invented this procedure, uh, I did just a number of cases as proof of concept, uh, and then we did our first dive maybe two years ago into data analysis for efficacy, and things look to be uh, about what I was experiencing. What I mean by that is that as a doctor, I can say, well, you know, about seven out of my 10 patients or seven out of 10 of my patients do really well with this. Um, but you also need to check that against the data that's being collected behind the scenes to make sure that that's really the case. So that was good that we, we saw that. And we've done some refinement of the procedure since we've added in dual C arms, so the procedure today is much better than it was even a year ago, because uh, we put that uh, in place in 2022. And uh, we just, I just got in October when I was out, the data analysis comparing normal ligaments and HEDS patients. And that data analysis, which I'll go over again on Friday, um, brings up this, who should avoid the procedure? And, you know, as we get more and more information on uh, data, and I get much, much more experience on how certain patient populations respond or don't respond, this becomes a critical question to ask. Because I don't care what your procedure is, C1, C2 fusion, uh, Garmin holes type, bigger fusion, prolotherapy, whatever, you always have patients who you should avoid. And this procedure is obviously no different. So 
this is actually from that fall 22 data analysis, again, that I'll be presenting this Friday, January 6th. Um, and that uh, that's already done. I've put all that data together, so that's ready to go. Um, and this is the neck disability index. And it happened to be here that this is the change in the neck disability index. And for the neck disability index, going down in the number is good. And going up is the opposite of good. And this was normal and hypermobile patients. So there's not much difference between these two average, the averages in these two data points here. But uh, I like this presentation of the data uh, because it shows who is where. So if we look at this green box here and we look at all of these people, you get a sense of who is where. Um, so if we look at this kind of thing, we can say, well, the vast majority of those people are in the green box. That's where we want them. They're either not changing very much or getting better. But we do have the vast minority who are in these other groups. Now, this first group here in yellow, you know, it's hard to detect uh, less than a 15% change. Uh, so they might be slightly worse uh, they're, but they're within what's called a binning margin, and that is uh, less than 15% change. So, you know, if we look at same or better using neck disability index, that's 79%. Uh, if we look at the slightly worse category, that's 14%. And if we look at the clearly worse category, that's 5%. Now, that's pretty close to what I would have said in that about seven in 10 of our patients, so 70%, which is kind of what you see if you look at and you create this kind of thing from here on down are doing better. Uh, the rest are either not changing uh, or sort of continuing with their problem, which gets worse over time. But we do have this about one in 20 or 5% of patients who probably shouldn't get this procedure because for whatever reason it flares them up from a long-term basis. Now, this is a different look of that same data. Um, now, this is a little bit more comprehensive, right? Because before it just neck issues and problems related to neck issues, but not all of our patients have neck problems, which is one of the things I've talked to you about before, how difficult it is to look at this data, because when you're treating a neck problem and not everyone would state that a neck issue is their number one problem, then that makes it hard to measure. But this is what's called a single assessment numeric evaluation or a percentage improvement. So again, if we look at this here, we've got same or better now at about 90%. And if you again, you know, bin out this part of people who didn't meet the 15% or more change. It's about seven out of 10, 75%, something like that, that are reporting that they are better after this procedure. And that better is beyond uh, that 15% margin, meaning if it's under 15%, generally people have a hard time uh, determining that with any accuracy. So about 75% of these people are in the better category. But we still have that 7% here who would state that they're worse. Uh, and this gives you the distribution up here of uh, you know where they're falling, everything from 90% better, et cetera. So again, looking at both of these, and there's, we, we measured many more things, but I'm just looking at these two today. Um, it's about seven and 10 get better, about three and 10 really don't change very much. And about one in 20 or so um, are getting these long-term flare-ups. So how do we inform patients, hey, you probably shouldn't do this procedure. 
and give them some guidance there. And I've thought long and hard about this and been looking at this now for the last six months or so. And I've put together uh, some types of patients who probably shouldn't be uh, getting this. So who are these patients that should probably avoid PICL? So the biggest issue I think we see with PICL is that it's an outpatient procedure. And what do I mean by that? That means it's done in an outpatient physician's office. Yes, we have procedure rooms. Yes, we have a PACU, post-acute uh, care unit, where we are uh, recovering patients, but we're not a hospital. Uh, and that means the patients are expected to walk in for this procedure and walk out. And they're expected to be uh, managed on post-procedure medications that are oral or at the very most a patch and uh, post-procedure office visits, meaning that we're not putting these patients in the hospital for several days uh, as would occur if we were doing an upper cervical fusion. And because of that, that automatically tends to push out some people who probably shouldn't be getting an outpatient procedure to begin with. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So these are the poor candidate groups that I've been able to come up with. So unable to control symptoms, we'll talk about that. Um, the fragile egg, I've talked about that in the past. Uh, someone who needs narcotics just to function. Uh, a patient where we're really uncertain that CCI is causing the symptoms they experience. Uh, the rare patient that can't be positioned at all. And the patient who has multiple chemical sensitivities. I'm not talking about a uh, MCAS scenario here. I'm talking about someone who literally can't take any medication because it's all, uh, all causes problems for them. So uh, unable to control symptoms. Now, this is, I think, the biggest category that um, this year we're going to start to pretty aggressively exclude. And that means these are patients who no amount of medication or other treatment impacts their headaches, dizziness, or other symptoms. Um, and the problem with that, uh, especially if there's no amount of medication, uh, and we've had several people like this through the years, because any orthobiologic injection will increase inflammation. So there's no way to manage their symptoms after the procedure, uh, meaning if your headache's already a nine out, of, nine out of 10 and no medications, including narcotics, has ever touched it, you probably shouldn't be getting an outpatient procedure. So like I said, this year, 2023, we're going to get much, much more aggressive in who we uh, deny access to the procedure based on this issue. Uh, we've tried in the past to work with these patients but the failure rate is just too high among this group from what I see. And the likelihood, again, of putting them into some sort of prolonged flare-up is also too high. And then we've got the fragile egg or the central sensitization crowd. Now, I've talked about this. Central sensitization is a very real phenomenon. That means the nerves that carry pain signals become too sensitive to any stimulus. These patients will get major flare-ups with even a deep tissue massage, let alone a neck injection. And they're more likely to flare up not for days, but for weeks or for months. Now, this is one of those areas where we've tried to work with these patients to manage this. And sometimes we're successful. I'd say we're successful with two out of three of these patients in trying to reduce the amount we do out of the gate to manage this, ish, this issue, um, but about one in three just can't be effectively treated uh, at all because of this central sensitization. Another category would be needing narcotics to function. Now, this one, again, I'm kind of going down here. The first one, we're going to go uh, 
and put in some strict criteria this year and try to eliminate that patient population. The second one, um, we can kind of work with those people, but let them know that they've got about a one, one in three chance of this not working. And then we get to this group, uh, the group that needs at narcotics to function. Um, this is not an absolute contraindication, but it makes things much, much more difficult. Um, so their post-op pain management becomes very difficult, anesthesia is higher risk, et cetera. So uh, just realize that this one makes things more difficult, but it's not one where I think we're going to actively try to exclude these patients. Um, and this is one where we're probably not going to do too much differently other than to continue to define who a classic CCI patient is and who an atypical CCI patient is. So if you come in the office, you know, we may have this conversation. You know what? Given all of the parts and pieces here, I'm not 100% certain that, or I don't have a high confidence that CCI, as seen on the imaging, is causing your symptoms. Now, this is a hard one for patients to grasp because patients generally believe that if we see it on an image, it must be causing their problems. And the problem is that that's not usually the case, uh, meaning that you have to match uh, exam with the symptoms, with imaging, with response to treatment, all of that stuff. So this is a group we're watching, but I suspect that it represents some of those patients who get no results at all because uh, we didn't treat their problem that was causing their symptoms. We treated their CCI, but CCI wasn't causing their symptoms. Uh, this is now more a rare one, but we do come across a rare patient that can't be positioned uh, or is very, very difficult to position. And obviously this can reduce the efficacy of what we're trying to do because all of the procedures that we do require specific, uh, very tightly controlled patient positions in order to safely get where we want to be. And then finally, this isn't one I come across very often. Uh, make sure that you understand. We're not talking about MCAS here where we're giving someone some Benadryl. We're talking about a patient who is convinced that they can't take certain medications and uh, those very specific uh, beliefs uh, reduce our ability to help them because you know outpatient uh, narcotics can't be taken because it has some ingredient that doesn't work or uh, the antibiotics won't work or whatever it is. So we're not talking about MCAS here. We're talking about patients who give a very specific list of what doesn't work for them. Uh, and then we look at everything we need to use to keep that patient safe. And there's a conflict there. Okay, so as usual, uh, question time. Hopefully you've been writing some questions I can't see while I'm doing this, but I will stop this and we will go to some questions here about this topic. Okay, here we go. Uh, spinning advanced for fashion. If it feels like the pillow is made of some solid concrete material rather than being soft, what could it mean? Some irritation of cranial nerve. You know, Fatchin, I just don't know enough about what you're trying to get at there, meaning that um, I, I don't uh, understand the question completely or how that could be related to um, something going on in the neck. Now, we certainly have patients who uh, can't get into a comfortable position regardless of the pillow they use. Um, so maybe give me a little more information on that one. Uh, how come you wasn't live last week in two weeks? Oh, just taking some time off with my family. Uh, do you treat EDS patients? We do. I, that, that data I showed was an EDS and non. And we'll actually cover some more of that data uh, this coming Friday, January 6th. Lissy, can you get prolotherapy in multiple body parts? Uh, generally, you can if you're not the kind of patient 
who is centrally sensitized, like the kind I was discussing, or the fragile egg type patient. And those patients, we limit what they can do. It's been advanced by Fatchin. Um, is there a connection between certain antibiotics and damage to connective tissue? Uh, there's certainly a, a connection between uh, quinoline antibiotics and tendons. As far as antibiotics in ligament tissue, that's less, much less studied. Uh, generally, patients can get adjusted after uh, prolotherapy type treatments. Uh, let's see, there's a, something online called a Bighton score, B-I-E-G-H-T-O-N score, and that'd be a good place to start there to see if you're hypermobile. Uh, Fatchin, uh, are there dangers to CPP, curve restoration for people with EDS, and CPP only for trauma patients? Not only for trauma patients, but there's certainly, you know, we certainly tell patients uh, when would be a good time to start after all of this. Uh, can Z02 better treat an ultrasound guidance injection? No, that would be a very dangerous thing to do to inject uh, 01 or 12 using ultrasound guidance, in my opinion. Uh, I use ultrasound all day, every day. I use CR and fluoroscopy all day, every day. Um, there is no way to safely do uh, a 01 or 12 injection uh, because you wouldn't know with ultrasound that you were in the artery, in that case, the vertebral artery, which is right there. You also don't have as much control using ultrasound on where the needle is from a, a left, right, uh, uh, or up, down standpoint as compared to serum fluoroscopy. But serum fluoroscopy, you know where you are within a tenth of a millimeter within the body, as long as you take one view this way, one view that way. With ultrasound, that is much, much less uh, accurate. So for instance, uh, even an experienced ultrasound practitioner and a normal weight patient at that depth, let's say depth of an inch and a half, could be off by five millimeters or so and not know it. That could be the difference between injecting into the vertebral artery and hurting somebody, meaning that's a bad day for everybody, especially if it's prolotherapy solution, you could kill that person. Um, versus not. So no, ultrasound is not a good way to inject that area. Uh, you would need fluoroscopy plus digital subtraction uh, and geography. It's been advanced by Dr. DA. Can a massage aggravate a vagus nerve issue? Can being born with a broken collarbone cause a vagus nerve issue? Um, it would have to be a pretty deep massage, right? Because the vagus nerve is going to be pretty deep inside here. Um, so I would say the average massage, no. Can being born with a broken collarbone cause a vagus nerve issue? Um, unlikely to cause a vagus nerve issue because it's nowhere near the vagus nerve directly. Uh, that's a yes on that one. Uh, I think that's unlikely. I think we'll probably see platelet-rich plasma uh, coverage for things like knee osteoarthritis and, and lateral epicondylitis way before we see prolotherapy getting covered. Regenics, DA. Can a vagus nerve issue cause inflammation, food sensitivities, anxiety, severe constipation, upper abdominal pain, mimping heart and gallbladder type symptoms? If so, how would the vagus nerve be treated? Um... Can the vagus nerve issue cause inflammation? Unknown. Um, the overall concept behind uh, a vagus, well, let's, let's review for a second the vagus nerve in general to try to answer uh, your questions. So the purpose of the vagus nerve is the chill out effect, right? It's what reduces your heart rate. It's what helps you get into that place called a parasympathetic response where you can better digest your food. Um, so when we go to sleep at night, that's vagal nerve stimulation. We're chilling out, our heart rate is coming down, our food digestion goes up. Now, if you were to irritate the vagus nerve so it wasn't working properly, which can happen with upper cervical syndromes, you can certainly get uh, the opposite of chill out, which would be anxiety, 
Um, you could certainly get problems with uh, your heart rate going up. You could also get problems with digesting your food. So those are the kind of things that can happen uh, as far as food sensitivities or inflammation. I think that's unknown at this point and wouldn't make sense with what we currently know about vagus nerve function. But those other things, yes. Uh, as far as vagus nerve treatment, if it's due to CCI, then you treat the CCI. If it's due to something else, then, um, you know, there are, there are a few treatments. Um, now, there's, there are vagus nerve stimulators out there now, but that's an implantable permanent device um, and a pretty big deal to place it. Um, something that you might consider is to look up IPA physical therapy and Greg Johnson, uh, who started that, IPA physical therapy, uh, because they teach some courses in mobilization of the vagus nerve. So it's something that you might consider taking a look at. Uh, Christine Slagside, I didn't, if anyone should avoid it, I'm confused. Uh, yeah, Christine, there's definitely patients uh, that we've told through the years that we can't help you, right? Uh, and we have, uh, I just told a patient this week because of multiple chemical sensitivities that we wouldn't offer him the PICL procedure because we wouldn't be able to control it or control possible post-op pain or symptoms. So, uh, yep, there's definitely people who shouldn't do this procedure. And this year, like I said, we're going to get much more aggressive on those patients who have no control over their symptoms. And we're going to start denying them access to the procedure because if you've got no control of your symptoms before the procedure, then getting through the post-op part of the procedure, which is you know, relatively easy for, for most, but very difficult for some, uh, is too much to consider. Uh, Liam, regarding the ALR and transverse ligaments of PICL, is one harder to treat, heal than the other? Not really. It's a little harder to get in transverse than an ALR. Um, but, you know, we've kind of dialed that in through the years and can uh, get it probably 90% of the time. Uh, ALR, we can probably get 98% of the time. So it gives you some idea. There's a little difference there, but functionally not much. It's been advanced by Harry Winston. Are patients who shouldn't get a PICL procedure okay to get post or cervical injections? For the most part, Yes, but some of the same things apply here. So if you can't tolerate um, uh, any type of procedure, then kind of in the same boat. Uh, or if you have no control of your headaches and we're doing posterior injections to try to control your headaches, then again, we're going to have that same issue with, with uh, post-op pain control. I will say that for posterior injections, pay, patients generally tend to flare less often. So it's a little bit easier to open that throttle than it is for PICL. Liam, what is the percentage amount of CO2 overhang reduction for one PICL in patients who respond well to good healing outcomes? I have six millimeter overhangs, wondering if most likely multiple PICL rounds. Yeah, Liam, so for responders, we're seeing about 25% or so, give or take, uh, per procedure. So if you just did the math there, 25% is 1.5 millimeters. So going from six to 4.5 to, you know, just under three uh, and then uh, just under one something, uh, that's generally how that would look. Anything under two, we would consider stone cold normal. Uh, are there even are there ever thresholds of morphometrics you would uh, suggest is too pathological? Not so much in um, numbers, so to speak. So, for instance, if someone has a grab oaks of ten versus eleven, or has uh, overhang of six versus seven. Um, but certainly there are patients through the years where we have seen frank, serious uh, compression altering the course of things like the brainstem, where it's pushed back on one side very, very severely, or there are other problems like a cyst coming off of C1, C2, 
uh, putting severe pressure on the brainstem because it's the size of a marble, um, where we just said, now nah, you're not a good candidate for this type of procedure. Um, and now, again, we're going to start taking this to the next level and um, you know, creating some direct contraindications to getting the procedure, that would be uncontrolled symptoms. Um, and then if there's relative contraindications or what that means to a doctor is patient can probably still get the procedure, but there's going to be a lot of discussion about whether or not they should get the procedure. Um, DA, how are, how are vagus nerve issues diagnosed? Um, there isn't a good way to diagnose a vagus nerve issue. I know of no test that can diagnose a vagus nerve issue. Um, it's mostly a clinical diagnosis based on some of the things uh, I was just talking about. Uh, butthead. Uh, hello, doc doctor. Since you do the PICL treatment, any thoughts on prolotherapy for CCI? Um, you know, it depends on the type of CCI. Um, so if we're talking about CCI that occurs in flexion due to the posterior ligaments, then prolotherapy can be very effective. Uh, if we're talking about lateral C1, C2 overhang or lateral atlanoaxial instability, then prolotherapy can be pretty ineffective, meaning not effective. Um, so it just depends on what it is we're, we're talking about. Or if there's uh, problems with extra motion and extension, prolotherapy isn't going to do much injecting back here posteriorly. So it just depends on, on what it is. Now, for the patients we do PICLs on, they generally have C1, C2 or lateral overhang, so prolotherapy just isn't going to get it done. Uh, maybe about a 10 to 15 percent response rate in my experience there. Robert, I presume the same failure patients who actually respond poorly to aesthetics and aesthetics propofol. Not necessarily. We certainly have patients who um, who are so difficult to keep under because of things like, and we've had these conversations before, low dose naltrexone, being on chronic narcotics, uh, uh, THC or CBD, those are things that can make anesthesia more difficult. So again, as I'll tell patients time and time again, if your anesthesia is made difficult by the medications that you're on, what that means is that your procedure becomes more difficult to do. We can get less done. Um, for example, meaning, um, you know, it may be very easy in a patient who's easy to keep asleep to do every possible ligament that I could reach. But doing that same thing in a patient that we're struggling to keep asleep um, generally doesn't happen. Uh, so that means that that person might get 60% of everything I can do because we looked at the risk benefit of keep trying to keep them asleep uh, versus doing more. And there are times that we just say, you know what, this isn't worth the risk here. We're going to dial that back. Regrettably, C4 through C7 fusion, failed off of this one, discectomy, CCS is symptomatic, was still permanently a candidate with your new criteria. Um, no, but I think, Mark, that's going to be one of those uh, discussion points. So that is, I just had a patient uh, like this, um, oh, probably two and a half weeks ago, that was fused from C2 to C4. Uh, she, you know, certainly could have had just a, a non-fusion there and a decompression, um, but got a fusion. Now, what that did is put a lot of pressure on the next level up, C1, C2. Uh, so we were treating adjacent segment disease presenting as craniocervical instability, meaning that the fusion was causing too much movement at C1-C2. And so we were chasing our tail. Now, she was definitely one of those patients who was too symptom symptomatically poorly controlled, but just within the tolerance. So we did a very, very small procedure with that patient. Now, in this case, a, a C4 through 7 fusion just realized that you're going to be putting more pressure on a, all of the areas above that. So that's going to be C3, 4, C2, 3, C1, 2, C0, C1. So again, we may be chasing our tail there. We may get you to feel better when we tighten that down and treat some things. 
but you may be the kind of patient that needs intermittent treatment because of that extra force that will be forever going above and below uh, the fusion. Robert, with your C01 Centeno technique, does this avoid, does it also avoid the vertebral artery? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the reason why I invented that technique, meaning that uh, the way that I was taught how to do a zero one put the vertebral artery at much, much more risk. Uh, and that was usually to come from below the joint and go up into the joint. Uh, the problem is the vertebral artery was kind of right there. So it was frequently hit during the procedure. Uh, the procedure I developed goes above the vertebral artery into the posterior aspect of the joint uh, opening that you can estimate based on a very specific type of x-ray, uh, an x-ray view. Um, and this is why I always talk about having digital subtraction and geography, because whether you use the technique that I invented or you use another technique, um, you have to make sure you're not in that vertebral artery when you inject, because if you do, that's a bad day for everyone. That supplies the blood to the back of the brain and cerebellum. So if you inject in there, depending on what it is you're injecting, you can cause a posterior circulation stroke. Uh, and as I always say, that's a bad day. Uh, so yes, you need digital subtraction angiography, which is a special add-on, uh, a vascular package to a fluoro machine, which allows you to isolate uh, the artery and see if you're injecting anything into it, uh, just when you're at the contrast injection stage. And if you are, you obviously move the needle and go someplace else, no harm, no foul. But it's the injecting of things that could clot the artery or, for instance, prolotherapy solution, which is uh, arterial toxic into the artery, as well as neurotoxic uh, into the circulation of the brain that can cause the problem. Uh, Kim, my shockwave treatment for upper cervical and it helped. Uh, well, that's great, Kim. I would definitely continue that as long as uh, you can do it. Um, I think we're probably talking about a different thing here, though, because there's nothing, uh, there's no way to get the shock waves into where they would need to go without hurting the spinal cord, because what we're talking about from the back here would be posterior to the spinal, or I'm sorry, anterior to the spinal cord. And if you're coming from the front, you'd have to go to the back of the mouth and get shockwave treatment there. So I think you're talking about more just pain coming from this upper cervical area and probably just the muscles that attach along the skull. But to the extent that shockwave treatment helps that, then absolutely. Robert, is there a specific time and injury is too old where PRP may not help? No, Robert, uh, as I, our data showed, um, we've published on this on tenocytes. We have all sorts of internal data on aged mesenchymal stem cells uh, that form some of the basis of the, the um, patents we were granted. Um, there is no age limit for PRP. Uh, that's because you can always increase the, uh, the concentration of PRP. Now, you have to be able to increase the concentration and most clinics that do PRP can't because it's just not something the little machine they bought can do. But assuming you have that ability, uh, there's not an issue, you just increase the concentration. And in fact, you get a, an amazing response out of older cells given higher dose PRP, whereas younger cells don't respond in the same way. So if I take a 20 year old cells and I give them you know, 1x PRP, meaning just the same concentration of platelets, then maybe I can get that much growth out of those cells. If I give them 10x, I'm not going to get much more, meaning 10 times as much. Now take a 45-year-old cells, and it's a completely different story. 1x does this, 5x does that, 10x does that, 20x does that. So again, you get an amazing dose response out of older cells when you dose them with higher PRP. You just have to be able to create the higher dose PRP, which regrettably most clinics cannot do. Uh, Regenix, made advanced by Sherry Kopp. Are patients who should not consider PICL procedure okay to get other procedures like for a knee? Oh, sure. This has nothing to do with other procedures at all. This is very, very specific to 
uh, the patient population that is getting this very specific procedure for craniocervical instability. So it has nothing to do with knees at all. Lissy, Dr. Hauser always offers on guidance on his patients because he needs to see the tube bar. He mentioned that no, that in one of his videos, though. Yeah, as I said, you can't use ultrasound guidance in the upper cervical spine. Uh, if that were to cause a stroke, then as the person who's injected more C0s, E1s, and C1, C2s than anyone else on earth, I would not defend that physician in court because there's no way to tell uh, whether or not you're in that vertebral artery. You can see the artery, but what you can't see is any difference in what the signal in the artery looks like if you happen to be injecting into it. And that's the problem, uh, because what you see on an ultrasound when you put on color Doppler, which is what we'd be talking about here, is you'll see a, a whoosh, 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 which is either red or blue, depending on if it's coming towards you or going away from you or coming towards you or going away from the probe. But you're not going to see much change in that that whoosh, whoosh, whoosh of color if you were to inadvertently be in the artery, whereas in digital subtraction angiography with fluoroscopy you would definitely see that um, because everything else is removed from the image. That's how digital subtraction and geography works. All the shadows, all the other structures, and all you see is the stuff either going into the artery or not. Um, so again, uh, in my medical opinion, ultrasound guidance in the upper cervical spine is below the standard of care primarily because you can't see definitively whether or not you're in that artery. And injecting into that artery, as I've said before, is a bad day for everybody, uh, meaning you can kill a patient doing that. Uh, certainly, you can change their lives in a, in a huge way, i.e. put them in the ICU, uh, cause a stroke that would cause permanent damage, et cetera, et cetera. So there's only one way to do that, and that's with digital subtraction angiography and fluoroscopy. Um, there's really no reason not to do it that way. Um, so if you're not doing it that way, I have no idea what, what it is they're doing. Kim, sorry I didn't finish my comment. Do you indicate shockwave treatment for after prolo? Or, um, again, shockwave treatment isn't going to penetrate to the depths uh, that we're talking about. And uh, there's no way to get that much energy where it needs to be because of how these structures uh, are. So let me pull up a picture on this one because this is a good one to understand because um, it applies to lots of things, not only shockwave therapy. Let's pull up some pictures here. Okay, here's one of our pictures. I'm going to put this in a PowerPoint presentation so I can draw on it. And we can discuss why this is a problem. Okay, let me share that. Okay, so, so the ligaments we're talking about are encased in bone. Um, and that's sort of their problem, right? Because let's think about this. We have a spinal cord that's sitting right here. I didn't draw it that well. I've got, I've got a kind of cut, cattywampus there, but you get the idea. Um, and that spinal cord is encased by bone, right? Bone bone, bone, shock wave is going to come in from the outside and it's going to hit that bone and bounce right off the bone. That's what, that's how shock wave works. That's why ultrasound works, uh, et cetera. Um, and the ligaments we're trying to reach are deep in here. Now, even if we put the shock wave probe in the back of your throat, which is not something I think most sane people would do, we're still got the same problem. It's going to reflect off the bone. Um, so we're not going to get into the alar ligaments here and the transverse ligament here 
And if we, even if we jacked up the shock wave high enough to make it through the little tiny areas where there is no bone in between the vertebrae, we would damage the spinal cord. So we can't do that. So there's just no way to make that work regrettably. Now what shockwave can do, uh, and I was just talking about this, is that if you've got some tendinopathy along the skull base, um, then that's something that might work very well with shockwave. But as far as getting to these ligaments, um, it's just not going to get there. So no, I wouldn't recommend it if we're trying to treat deep structures um, because all of those deep structures are going to be surrounded by bone. Uh, Bethany, does PSC have the ability to pull CMOS2 back in place without a NUCA adjustment, especially adjustments don't hold? Yeah, Bethany, what I always recommend, uh, and this said this a lot, a lot of times during, during this type of presentation, um, is that if you have an AO or a NUCA chiropractor that can give you temporary relief, that you go back to that chiropractor. In fact, a lot of patients who are in that group of having increased symptoms like increased headaches or dizziness, dizziness symptoms after this procedure, who then go back and get adjusted, do very well. It goes That goes away very quickly. So it can really help with post-op flares. Um, so you'd wanna go back immediately. There is no contraindication to going back the next day even after this kind of procedure. Ryan, can plate lysate help break up epidural fibrosis or any regenerative medicine that helps it? Um, we have used uh, plate lysate and epidural fibrosis. Um, depends on the extent of the fibrosis and how much that is causing a problem. If it's a very severe epidural fibrosis or something called a RAX catheter, R-A-C-Z catheter. Um, but uh, for, the, for most patients that have this problem of scarring after a surgery um, around the nerve roots, we can usually break it up. Uh, sometimes we, we, we will use a small pliable catheter placed in the epidural space through which we inject uh, platelet lysate. I'd actually do thank you for answering questions. How many rounds of PRP would you recommend before we move on to PICL? A lot of that depends on how you respond. Um, so if you're responding well and getting iterative improvement each time of let's let's put a cutoff of at least 15 to 20 percent, then I would continue getting that type of treatment until you max out um, uh, before considering PICL. Now, if you're doing one PRP and you get 10 percent, the second one, maybe 5 percent more. It's probably not the right thing, but if the first PRP gives you a 25% improvement and the third one gives you a 30, or the, sorry, the second one gives you a 30% improvement, then I would definitely do a third. Yeah, I used to be able to do vagus nerve stimulation to my ear medical device after my neck injury. Doing this gives me nerve pain. Just makes sense that the nerve is angry from compression. Um, yes, Pia, that, that would be the general idea, that the nerve would be irritated, not functioning really well, uh, not so much due to compression as it is due to irritation, meaning the nerve is getting banged into, um, uh, rather than um, being statically compressed. Sharon, uh, hi, Dr. Tino. Thank you for answering questions. How many rounds of PRP? Got, got that. Uh, Diana, what if what if you can tolerate procedures but become symptomatic or you flare easily? Um, again, if you tolerate procedures, that's really what we're talking about. As far as getting a huge flare uh, from small things like a bump in the road, that's usually not a problem with this procedure. That would tend to be more like the average PICL patient. But uh, when I say a, a fragile egg, I'm talking about someone who would get a, um, a neck injection and be down for three weeks, uh, whereas the average person would be three days of, of mild increased soreness, that kind of thing. Uh, can you see blood vessels in the hip and x-ray guidance or ultrasound guidance or rarely? Um, you can see them on ultrasound if you look for them, and it depends on which vessels we're talking about. So um, it also depends on how large the patient is. Just realize that 
um, ultrasound is very sensitive to weight, um, whereas um, uh, X-ray has some sensitivity weight, but less so. So, for instance, uh, if you had a, a, a patient who was, you know, five foot ten, I'm five foot ten, and uh, instead of being 190 pounds, that person was 300 pounds. Um, seeing blood vessels in that hip is going to be a lot more difficult under ultrasound than seeing it in my hip at 190 pounds. Um, or whereas x-ray guidance would probably not be very different between the two. It'd just be a, a longer needle to get there. Uh, but the x-ray guidance is going to be different in that size range. Now, take, for example, a 450 pound patient in my height, which I did uh, probably about three months ago. Now we're in a situation where ultrasounds off the table uh, because of their size. Uh, it's just going to be very, very highly inaccurate. We can use x-ray, but even x-ray is starting to struggle because we're having to, the machine is increasing the amount of radiation so much um, and you're still not getting a great image. So um, that's kind of how that works. Sharon, how do you determine whether or not a patient is a PICL candidate? Do you rely on measurements only? Um, yeah, Sharon, I think I've gone over this a bunch of different times. Let me do it again. Um, number one, uh, there has to be some reason to have CCI. We do not accept, for example, COVID as a cause or the vaccine as a cause. Uh, and we're very strict about that. Uh, number two, the patient would need to have, obviously, CCI and imaging. Number three, uh, the patient would have to have an exam that localizes to the upper cervical spine. Uh, number four, the patient would have to have symptoms that fit within that spectrum of CCI symptoms that I've described a number of times on here. And then the fifth kicker is usually a response to treatment that makes sense. So for instance, a collar helps a lot, or if they can't tolerate a collar, active physical therapy makes it work worse, or AO or NUCA chiropractic uh, generally make it better, that kind of stuff. Lisi, can you can you inject into the fusion or above, below for the neck and back? Yeah, Ulysses. So we do uh, we inject above and below the fusion at the adjacent segment disease all the time. Uh, we don't generally inject into the fusion level because it's usually not needed, but sometimes we've done that as well. Uh, Dr. Tina, have you heard of? ASEA redox something that supposedly can help improve cell signal levels and promote self repair. Um, yeah, I don't know if that's going to help ligament repair. I suspect the people that are selling it also have no clue whether it helps ligament repair or not, meaning that um, we're going to test some of the, um, the peptides here coming up. That's on our, our lab list. I had talked to uh, Dan Semrad, who runs the Facebook group, because uh, Dan had asked some questions about those. And um, so we're going to test probably four or five of those peptides with real cells and compare those to PRP in the lab. As far as a redox supplement, regrettably, I don't think that's testable, uh, given what we're trying, meaning we would need something that's injected that could be injected intravenous uh, rather than oral. Uh, Robert, uh, to add to my question of injury age, uh, can such torn fibers be scarred and thus not able to accept platelets? Um, I think what you're talking about is maybe uh, something that would be beyond the use of bone marrow concentrate. Um, so that would be uh, a ligament or a tendon that's pulled back and retracted, and there's two torn ends. Um, as far as torn fibers being scarred, um, there's some scar tissue that can happen there, but that's usually easily broken up. And as long as there's fibers uh, that are connected, we're good. Uh, what are your thoughts about a combination of prolo and PRP for posteriors? Um, you can't combine prolo and PRP. Uh, let me see if I can pull that up for you here because I blogged on that 
I don't know, maybe about two years ago. Let's see here. Um, okay, so let me share that. So, uh, platelet raisins, can you add prolotherapy and PRP together? Uh, so you can, you can spike prolotherapy solution with a platelet lysate, which is the growth factors taken from platelets. But you need a lab to create platelet lysate. So if all you've got is a little bedside centrifuge, you can't add prolotherapy and PRP together. And you might ask why. Um, and there's a little video here that shows why, but it has to do with what's called osmolarity. So basically you'll turn uh, the PRP solution, will turn the platelets into raisins and dehydrate the platelets and damage them. Platelets are, uh, it's extremely important to keep them live and functional because they are a time release mechanism and they release certain growth factors on different days based on what's needed in the environment. They also sense what's needed in the environment for healing. So you wouldn't want to damage platelets by adding prolotherapy solution and turning them into platelet raisins. So if you see someone that's doing this and combining PRP with prolotherapy solution, you need to run because they don't really have the basics down yet of orthobiologics. Kim, uh, sure. Finn can use PRP or stem cells on upper cervical, but is dextrose phenol not safer for upper cervical? Ooh, uh, phenol. So yeah, let's, let's go through that whole concept. Um, Cause again, I think uh, there's some basic uh, stuff that you guys are missing out on here. Um, so let's see what's the best way to discuss that one. Okay, so when it comes to prolotherapy, how does prolotherapy work? That would either be dextrose. Uh, you can also add phenol to prolotherapy. Uh, so what is, let's, let's start with dextrose because that's the easier one. So it's hypertonic dextrose. Um, so what hypertonic means is that it's more concentrated than the body solutions. I want to see if I can find that presentation, see if I still have it on the platelet raisins because that will be helpful for you guys. Okay, yes, I do. Okay, so this might get, this might be more information than you bargained for, but I think it's, it's worth looking at. Um, because it's worth understanding how these things work. Because um, I think if you don't understand how the, these things work, we're in a lot of trouble. Okay, so I'm going to just share my screen here. And I'm going to give you this short presentation on prolotherapy and platelet raisins and back into how prolotherapy works, whether it's dextrose, or phenol, uh, or both, or either one of those. Um, so let's see here. Hello, and today we're talking. Can't do that. I don't want to listen to myself. Okay, so this would be the one uh, that's important here. So uh, those little dots represent concentration. Um, so this was talking about platelet raisins. And that is prolotherapy works because the concentration of your body is 0.9% or seawater. So that's represented inside this platelet here. It looks like a moon shape that I've uh, drawn. So you see there's a smaller or lower density of blue dots here. And then a higher density of dots out here. The higher density is the prolotherapy solution, meaning it's more concentrated. The lower density is your body. So uh, what happens there is that 
the water goes out of the platelet in order to make that concentration the same on either side of that membrane. And so prolotherapy in general uh, works that same way. Prolotherapy works by doing local chemical damage to the site. And that small amount of chemical damage is met with the body through, by an inflammatory response. So it's just like uh, a non-healing wound. So let's say you had a non-healing diabetic skin ulcer and the doctor was debriding it. What, what does the doctor do? The doctor goes in and picks out the dead parts. He causes damage to get it to heal. And they do that once every couple of weeks until the thing heals. Prolotherapy is chemical damage, a chemical debridement. So that's how prolotherapy works. Now, if you go from dextrose and you add phenol, you get more damage. So you've increased the power of the prolo solution. But injecting either one in the upper cervical spine can be very, very high risk because you've got structures up there like the vertebral artery that if you injected um, prolotherapy solution, dextrose or dextrose plus phenol, you would destroy the artery and the brain tissue that the artery served. Now, if you injected inadvertently PRP into that artery, as long as it didn't clot, be no harm, no foul. It'd just be platelets. Those are common in blood. Inject phenol into that artery and that person's dead. So you see the difference here, whether it's a bone marrow concentrate procedure or a PRP procedure, those are regenerative and things that are in your body to begin with. They're just at higher concentrations of those parts. But when it comes to prolotherapy solution, prolotherapy solution works by causing damage. Now, prolotherapy solution can be very effective in the right circumstances when you know where it is you're injecting it. But injecting into the upper cervical spine and inadvertently injecting phenol into the vertebral artery and you've almost certainly killed or maimed that patient for life. So no, it's the opposite. Uh, you've got it backwards there, that much, much safer to inject PRP in the upper cervical spine than dextrose and or phenol, because both dextrose and phenol would be toxic to brain cells, would be toxic to artery cells, because that's how they work. Uh, and that's why you don't inject them in arteries. That's why you don't inject them into nerve tissue. Because if you did that, you'd kill the nerve tissue or you'd kill the artery. Mark, will max daily dosage of pregabalin and acetaminophen during flare-ups is slipping from the future PICL? Um, no, no. I mean, if that's what is required, that's having that's having the ability to manage the flare with medications, which is a okay. It's just the patients that can't manage anything with medications, meaning that they already know, for instance, that they've tried every narcotic given to them, five different uh, headaches or I'm sorry, medications for migraine, um, six different other pain medications, and not a single one of those has ever touched their headache. Those are the patients I'm talking about, not the patients who can manage their headaches uh, I'm not sure if you have headaches, but that's the discussion here with Lyrica and Tylenol. Jennifer, uh, I have neck pain, headaches, dizziness, and diagnosis of exceptional neurology. I also have tendinosis in my hip. I think you need to have both my neck and my hip done. Would it make sense to do it at the same time or uh, one at a time? Yeah, so as always say, if you can tolerate doing two areas at once and you're in that patient population, which is most patients, then yes, by all means, get them treated uh, at the same time. Um, now, uh, you know, whether or not, you, I mean, oxyphone neurology isn't so much a diagnosis as it is a description of what's going on. A diagnosis would be the root cause of the problem. So oxyphone neurology just means that the occipital nerves are getting pissed off. The question is why? So uh, if you can answer why, then you have a diagnosis. If uh, all you're giving me is a description of what's pissed off, then that's not a diagnosis. The question is why are they pissed off? And once we can get to why, we can look at what treatments are available. 
So really important distinction there to make, the distinction that we doctors make, but a lot of times patients don't, is that some of these monikers we're given are descriptions of what's going on. So another one would be, I've got increased in intracranial pressure. Why? Knowing you have increased intracranial pressure doesn't get us very far, right? I can maybe put you on some Dimox, maybe that helps, maybe it doesn't. But until we know why, we can't figure out how to help you long term. Uh, Mircea, hi, doctor. In practice, do you see C2 malrotation, rotate out of place resolution with PICL? Is that something eventually has to resolve with fusion? No, we wouldn't want to do a fusion. That would be the absolute last choice, right? Because once we go down that road, uh, we're going to see a lot of downstream side effects from the fusion and we can't go backwards. Um, so that might need to be done, but yes, I would say the vast majority of the patients we treat have a C2 malrotation, uh, and that's due to laxity at C1, C2. I've got a blog on that and why that happens that you may want to take a look at here. Let's see. Um, let see. I'm just trying to pull that up. So read this blog. So read this blog uh, and you can go back here. Hopefully you can get uh, what this is. But if you just go to regenix.com and let me see. Uh, I can't move it out of place there, guys. Looks like we have some stuff covering it. But if you go to regenix.com, R-E-G-E-N-E-X-X, -X, uh, and just type in uh, C1, C2, uh, unstable, uh, this will come up on the search uh, bar right, right in there. Uh, and basically what it talks about is how all this works and how all the parts come together and how we've got this biconvex joint. So when uh, there's... Ligament laxity, you get one side rotating forward on the other. Um, the rotation isn't so much the problem as the laxity that causes the rotation. Again, we talk, just talked about that, right? Um, so a C1, C2 malrotation is the description. Um, but what's causing that C1, C2 malrotation? And in this case, usually in CCI patients, it's laxity. So the, the goal is to fix the laxity. And you certainly may need to be seen by a qualified AO or NUCA chiropractor. Finn, PRP and stem cells can be expected to be more regenerative than prolotherapy, but is prolotherapy better for tightening? No, I mean, the best way to describe this, I've used all of these. I don't know how many prolotherapy injections I've done at this point, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, maybe more. Um, and I've done equal or higher numbers of PRP injections, uh, probably done more bone marrow concentrate injections than anyone on earth at this point could be pretty close. Um, but the, uh, if you look at an SI joint model, so something we commonly would treat would be SI joint instability in women. Uh, so for SI joint instability in women, it's usually six to eight prolotherapy visits to tighten that, that ligament up. And then uh, for PRP, we would half that. So three to four treatments. And for bone marrow concentrate, we would half that. So generally one to two treatments. Uh, so that's how that works with regard to tightening ability based on uh, my experience of using all three of those for 20 plus years now. Neil, with central sensitization is the idea that you limit the amount of injections to PICL, hoping that procedure promotes healing and therefore leads to CNS calming down, then more intense second round. Yeah, that's the idea. I mean, the problem with central sensitization is, is tipping the patient over uh, and pushing them off the ledge. Um, so you really have to be careful to push them right up to the, the ledge, but not over it. And so, yeah, the goal is to push them right up to that ledge and then they feel better. Um, but if you push them over that ledge, you can tilt them into a more permanent or semi-permanent or a long-term flare-up. So that's the, the problem with central sensitization. 
uh, Ulysses, have you made a video for ultrasound and x-ray difference? Um, I did a blog on the ultrasound thing. Let's see, you might be in luck here. Yeah, there's a blog on it for sure. I don't know if I did a video on it. I think I did. Pretty sure I did a video. Uh, so if you prefer a video, just search the YouTube channel. I would type in C1, C2 under ultrasound. Um, but this is actually uh, from a video I found online that talks about using this huge needle uh, to inject C1, C2. Um, and the problem with uh, determining exactly where that needle tip is located with ultrasound um, and that this provider documented uh, that uh, they were probably doing this, meaning they had lost track, in my opinion, of the needle tip here while they were uh, coming close to that C1, C2 joint where the vertebral artery uh, lives right there. So I had actually drawn this out um, showing that you had to get the needle in that little target there in order to be safe. If you went too far lateral, you ended up in the vertebral artery. If you went too far medial at the wrong spot, you ended up in the upper spinal cord. Um, and don't think that that doesn't happen. I know of at least one case that happened here in the last three months where someone attempting to inject one of these joints, zero, one, and one, two, ended up in the brainstem. Uh, and that person is now in rehab, meaning stroke rehab. Uh, and that was a young kid, a young person. So don't believe this stuff doesn't happen. It happens. So anyway, this would be a good one to go through. It goes through the whole thing that we just talked about. And so go to Regenix.com, go to the blog, which is going to be, or you can just type in the search bar. I would just type in C1, C2 and ultrasound. I think I did a video on this too. So to the extent that I did a video, uh, just search the YouTube channel the same way, C1, C2 and ultrasound. Stephanie, 24-7 uh, clacking and cracking at base of skull when walking any activity. Quite literally feels like the dens is moving. I wonder if this is a mark of severity. No, I mean, that's pretty common complaint uh, with my CCI patients. So that's something that can definitely, um, definitely happen in patients that have laxity. Robert, do all... Do all who are in spinal jack study learn your research and do you have to implement it? Probably make sure also Orogenics SIS. No, that's a different uh, deal. Um, so let's see here. Robert, let me uh, see if I can do a Venn diagram. I used to hate Venn diagrams uh, when I was in school. I'm sure you guys might too, but I'm going to torture you here with a Venn diagram. Okay. So there's lots of different professional societies. One of those is Spinal Injection Society. Uh, interestingly, it used to be called ISIS. Uh, International Spinal Injection Society, but then ISIS, the terrorist group came around and, and all of a sudden they changed their name, made sense. Um, so let's see here, if we share my screen. So uh, Spinal Injection Society would be the bigger organization, but very few people within the Spinal Injection Society would do a lot of regenerative medicine. Now, these days there's more, but still not that many. Um, so we would have as a subset of that, the, the doctors that uh, do regen. And then when it comes to the doctors that are regenics, they've got to qualify in um, so I'm just going to keep that 
I don't think I can get it that big as an R. So they've got to qualify in. Um, so they might be SIS members doing a regenerative medicine, but then uh, we add much more additional training on top of that. And again, none of our network doctors at this point are, rec are receiving or we are uh, sending any upper cervical referrals to any. So if we're talking about upper cervical, based on uh, the recent tragedy that happened uh, with an upper cervical C0-C1 uh, joint injection, we do not recommend any Regenix Network doctor to treat the upper cervical spine. Uh, but this will answer your question about SIS. Okay, let's stop that. Can't find a doctor who sees zero to two injections for neck in New York City. Um, yeah, there's no doctor in New York City that would have the requisite experience to inject zero one or one two facets. That means in my book that they do that procedure at least several hundred times a year, um, just like they would inject an L5S1 epidural several hundred times a year. So no, doesn't exist in New York City, doesn't exist in LA, doesn't exist in London, doesn't exist any place outside of Colorado. Finn, some prolotherapists only inject an over posterior ligaments for CCI, sometimes even only nuchal. Despite this, they quote successful outcomes in split ranging 60 to 80%. Does Regenix have hard data success for PSCL anterior posterior injections alone? Uh, well, first thing, uh, PSCL is not um, uh, Regenix, meaning that's Centeno Schultz only. So there is no Regenix site that does PICL or offers PICL. That's going to be only Colorado and Centeno Schultz. Um, when it comes to uh, instability ranging from 60 to 80%, uh, listen, I, I did the original prolotherapy research. Let's see if we can find that. Let me pull up PubMed here for you. Okay, let's go and see what that's all about. So the original cervical prolotherapy research was done by uh, me in 2005. And what we showed was objectively that we could reduce uh, instability in flexion uh, that we had measured on flexion extension x-rays for patients who had been in car crashes and had instability. So prolotherapy for uh, instability in flexion uh, as seen on flexion extension x-rays that's causing symptoms can be very effective. I think 60 to 80% is about right. Now, when it comes to craniocervical instability, totally different game now. Uh, now we're talking not about C23, 34, 4, 5, 5, 6. We're talking about 0, 1, 1, 2. Um, now, if the instability is still in flexion, which would be the minority of patients who I see that have CCI, then posterior prolotherapy at the nuchal ligament can be very effective. It's just not effective when there's lateral C1, C2 instability, meaning it only works about 10 or 15% of the time. Uh, so I see a lot of people wasting a lot of money, uh, meaning they're going to prolotherapy clinics that'll do 10, 20 visits. Um, and there may be 20% better after 10 or 20% visits, primarily, or 10 or 20 visits, primarily because the right things were never injected, meaning those are not the ways that you would treat that problem. For the ones that do get better and do have legitimate CCI, it's usually something like a C23, uh, where C2 is going forward on C3, that you can treat all day long from a posterior prolotherapy injection. What you can't do is to treat lateral lanoaxial instability, just won't work or anything involving the transverse or alar ligament just won't work. So again, uh, I don't know who you're going and whether or not they've published anything on prolotherapy, but you know, our 2005 publication showed that you can certainly treat anterior instability where one vertebra slips forward on the other when the person looks down. Obviously, any other type of instability you can't treat because you can't get to those ligaments from the back. 
Uh, Stephanie Russo, 24-7 hip feeling not connected, neck and heaviness, massive overhang, external support unhelpful, quality of life not existing. Do I cut to surgical consultation eight months since extreme accident? Uh, I don't know what massive overhang is. So, um, so again, the answer is, uh, I don't know your specific situation, but the answer is usually not, no. Um, meaning that uh, the vast majority of those patients, we can help with PICL and ejection without getting surgery. And once you get surgery, you can't go back. Um, and lots and lots of problems with fusions. So, um, but I don't know all of your information. So uh, certainly uh, contacting Carla would be a good way to uh, try to get in uh, on a telemedicine to see whether or not we can help. I'm gonna put her information here. Uh, she's my assistant. I'll put it in the uh, comments there. She'd be the person to contact about doing that. Kind of scary for a doctor to inject these blood vessels without any type of skills. Um, yeah, you'll see, just to give you an example, um, if you're the average doctor doing prolotherapy out there, um, your, your skills, as I would look at them, are about a one to two out of 10. Uh, now let's take our fellows, the doctors who we train in the office. Uh, and those are doctors who already start with those same prolotherapy type skills. And they even got more skills than that because they can do x-ray guided injections with contrast or usually in the lumbar spine by the time they get to us. So we spend a year with those doctors and let's say we get their skill up to a six. Um, now, not many of them are doing many injections. Even our best fellows who spent two years with us only got to inject this area maybe 10 times during their fellowship. Not enough to really understand which end is up other than generally how the procedure is done. Um, so for a prolotherapy doctor to start using ultrasound to try to inject C1, C2, yeah, that's scary. That's scary as hell in my opinion. Um, and the reason why I wrote that blog because that's just you know one bad day away from a really, really bad result. Um, Stephanie, failure is return from the bone connection with this bone that obviously is regular to regular, must be neurosurgeon. Do the consistency intensity say I'm trying to let it believe I have full tears? No, Stephanie, it's extremely unlikely that you have a full retracted tear of your ALR uh, ligament. Uh, while that's possible uh, for patients that are reporting what you're reporting, that maybe happens 5% of the time. Um, so that's usually not what's there. Now, if we really want to know, we could certainly get an upper cervical MRI uh, on a three Tesla magnet with a head coil using a very, very specific protocol. But uh, there'd be, um, outside of that, that's the only way we could look at whether or not those ligaments were still intact. Um, Janelle, before having initial consult with you, should have a DMX done. Um, yeah, DMX would be a great idea. Um, for sure. That would really help uh, me in trying to be able to say, here's what we need to do uh, next. Uh, okay, guys, I think we're at an hour and 20 minutes. Try to give us some extra, give you guys some extra time today because I know I've been uh, absent for the last 10 days or so, just enjoying the holiday with my family. Um, so uh, again, what we talked about today was um, which patients should probably avoid this type of outpatient PICL procedure. Um, now that's only about one in 20 or 5% of the patients that we see. Um, so 95% of the patients, it's what I just talked about, isn't really gonna change much for. But the 5%, we're gonna get a little stricter this year on. Uh, and so if you've got, if you fall in any of those categories where it's a direct contraindication, we'll let you know. Um, in the meantime, this Friday, I'll presenting, be presenting the uh, fall 2022 data that I got back in October. I just haven't had a chance since I was gone there for a while to put together, but that'll be presented. That was the difference between uh, the regular uh, ligaments and uh, 
uh, hypermobile EDS. And I showed a little bit of that information. If you go to earlier in the uh, video, I showed a little bit of that information. And uh, basically what it showed is basically what I've been saying, which is about seven out of 10 patients do well with this procedure. About three out of 10 really aren't changing very much. And about one in 20 or 5% uh, definitely have these long-term flares. So the goal is trying really hard to get rid of those long-term flares and to uh, try to decide who we should be very strict about and saying no to with regard to uh, trying this procedure. So on Friday, I'll go over the bigger data set uh, that was given to me back in October uh, that includes hundreds of patients and their outcomes. So uh, thanks so much for watching. I want everyone to have a great week. Happy New Year. Um, uh, happy holidays, all that good stuff. And I'll see you this Friday at one o'clock mountain, uh, which is three o'clock Eastern and 12 noon on the West Coast. Thank you so much.